All right, everybody, welcome back to the podcast where we discuss the plausibility of sci-fi concepts with experts. I'm your host, Heidi Compo, and today we are exploring the science behind the people of Wally. Now, this episode absolutely had to happen here on Reality Check because the question we are answering today is one that everybody has been asking literally since the movie came out in 2008. Are we turning into the people from Wally? And I could not think of anybody better for this episode than Steve Camp. For those of you who are unfamiliar, Steve is the rebel leader and father of Nerd Fitness, which has an online fitness community that has helped over 10 thousand one-on-one clients i don't know why i just did the donald trump thing just there Ten thousand. it's like a big emphasis that's a big deal Ten thousand one one-on-one clients and if that wasn't enough he also has a million nerds that he's helping monthly that's amazing like that is truly making a difference he's helping them respawn level up become better people overall Steve founded the company in 2009, and I've been a fan of his for a long time, and I'm really excited to have him on the show. So not only is Steve going to answer a burning question, are we turning into the people from Wally? He's also going to be diving into some practical solutions just for you, Reality Check Geeks. So without further ado, let's get ready for another mind-blowing episode of Reality Check. Okay, so we have all seen the movie, which came out in 2008. For those of you who love those movie facts and trivia that I do, but you may not have remembered that the ship that the humans were living on was called Axiom. But did you know that a real company called Axiom Space was founded eight years prior to when the movie came out? And what's even crazier is that Axiom Space is scheduled to open up a real live space hotel in the next five years or so. And that is a freaky eerie correlation because that just shows that sometimes science fiction really does predict the future, which is my whole interest for the show. And in the case of this episode, that would not be a good thing. So Steve, you mentioned that you rewatched Wally lately. So tell me some of your initial thoughts on this cute little Pixar film and how it just relates to some of the realities that it's exposing. Sure. First of all, hi, Idy. It's so good to be here. I am uh, a fan of, I, I started downloading the podcast and have been listening to your past episodes already and I've just thoroughly enjoyed it. The title, the conversation, the nerdiness, it checks every box for me. So thank you for putting this out into the world. I am honored to be here. And like everybody, I love Pixar. I love what they do. I love their creative process. I think their attention to detail is unlike anything I've maybe seen in any movie and Wally is no different. His mannerisms and the way that Wally feels like a real life, almost like half dog, half half human. He's got a little lunch pail that he brings with him to work every day. And his friend who's a cockroach, all of a sudden I'm like crying about a cockroach and two robots and their, their meat cute and how that worked out. I loved it. I loved the movie. I thought opening a, a kid's movie with 30 minutes of no dialogue <laughs> is really bold and was, I'm guessing, I've, I've read multiple books about Pixar's creative process and knowing what they had, the hoops they had to jump through to get that through to the final production is amazing. So you're watching this movie, these robots, and you see the giant trash piles on Earth. And then you see the, by and large, which is like the one company left on Earth. And you're like, oh boy, okay, I think I see where this is going. You think it's about robots. And then you meet the human population later on and you find out what humans have been up to for the last 700 years. And I remember watching this with my jaw on the ground in 2008 and I haven't seen it really since. So I watched it again this past weekend and my jaw remained on the ground. It's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe Pixar was able and willing and had the risk and the, I guess the appetite to portray humans in this way, really bold, really challenging. I think initially my thoughts were like, oh boy, you definitely can't make this movie in 2023. But the more I thought about it and the more I watched it, the more I realized it wasn't about human moral failings, but instead it was about just how important our environments are to shaping who we are as people. So I'm really excited to talk about that on this podcast, but just everything about the movie, uh, Pixar, I think, uh, geez, I want to say it was Andrew Bird potentially did the directing. I can't remember if I'm getting that right, but 
just a, a masterclass in visual storytelling and then combined with just great you know, artificial intelligence and hum behavioral human stuff and humor between two robots speaking two different languages. I just, I loved everything about it. Yeah, it, it was super cute. And, and I loved what you said about it was a bold move for them because I would probably tend to agree with you that it's, I don't know if it's something that they could do now because our thoughts and opinions have really changed about what's okay and what's not okay to portray in movies. And our culture has really made a big shift with the way that we are treating larger sized people. And some of it's for the good, I'll admit that. And some of it's not as good. Like I absolutely love the fact that there is this whole movement saying big is beautiful. And I agree with that. I think people can be drop dead attractive at any size. People are a thousand percent valuable at any size. People are worthy at every size. And I'm happy for those aspects, but people can't necessarily be healthy at every size. And I think that we see that dichotomy in our culture today. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, and obviously going to tread very lightly here, like you, I think everybody is worthy. I also don't think that somebody's size or their struggles with, with food is a moral failing. I think it's really easy these days to portray people as as lazy or simply tell them to put the fork down the reality is like we're not humans we're not dramatically different than we have been for the past what, for 150,000 years as a species the thing that has changed is our environment and technology and society so there are many aspects to humans that despite like we all know eating broccoli and chicken is better than eating French fries and pizza, like this, we all know that, but shaming people or, or telling them that they're somehow a, a failure as a result of not being able to stick with certain things, I think speaks more to the person making those claims and not to the people that are potentially struggling with this stuff. So this is a, a place that Nerd Fitness, I'm really proud of that we've been able to help and show as much compassion and empathy as possible for people because this stuff is really hard. Like, first of all, pizza is amazing. Yeah. It's so good. And I can't imagine a life without carbs. Not interested. At the same time, there's so many aspects that are at play here. Like, yes, our weight is a simple math equation of calories in versus calories out. Uh, at the same time, it's really complex. We have hormones. People are living in food deserts. The socioeconomic status they might have. They're working three jobs with three, with three kids. And and they're the only person at home and their kid wants to go to McDonald's, like, I'm not going to fault them for that. So mm -hmm. it's really easy to preach and to tell people that they must give up certain foods or they should be afraid of other things. And that the, the evidence is in just shaming people and yelling at them and trying to tell them more knowledge about the things they already know isn't working. So we're going to need to try some different stuff. And that's what we're trying to do at Nerd Fitness. I love that. And that's one thing I've always like, I was saying this to you before we hit record, but it's like, that's something I've always loved about nerd fitness is you have taken something that's, it's like, if you take the lens of fitness and you look at it, like in the 1970s and 1980s, you watch those old school films, the jocks were the bullies and it's like the jocks were the cool kids. And it was like not accessible to anybody else. And the world has really changed. Like now we see like our teens, world's strongest band competitor came out and like openly admitted, like he was like coming out of the closet that he plays Dungeons and Dragons. And I'm like, I love seeing people with more diverse interests being represented in fitness. And that's something I appreciate about your business. So tell me a little bit about this. I am curious about why, why psychologically do we know that something's good or bad, but we make those choices. Have you discovered some solutions or answers to that working with this specific population? Because we know we shouldn't have pizza. We know we should eat more broccoli, but we just don't. Like, I'll admit it. I had two, not one, but two slices of Costco pizza over the weekend at the same time. I knew we should, but I should. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, so again, uh, speaking, at, speaking of this as a fellow nerd who also has tons of insecurities and struggles, it's just that my struggles personally are not with, with food. I think the challenging aspect of it is for people that struggle with overeating, you have to eat every day. It's not like other addictions in which you could literally go cold turkey. You can enter, you can go to rehab and cut those things out. But rather, this is something that is truly something you're going to do every single day for the rest of your life. And that's combined with, like I said, environmental factors, socioeconomic factors, your mental health, all of these things have factored into the 
what's perceived as potential, like I said, a moral failing, but really it's like, there's not as much free will, I think in these areas as we might lead ourselves to believe. Even like registered dietitians, there's studies that have done like, I want, we want you to track your calories as a registered dietitian. And even registered dietitians who know these things, tracking all of their calories still tend to underestimate how much they're eating. People that mm. aren't registered dietitians that might be overweight can underestimate by as much as 40, 50%, 100%, 200%. It's really shocking and challenging to understand just how many calories we're putting in our body. So people come to Nerd Fitness, they're like, man, I've tried every diet. I tried keto because my coworker told me that I should go keto and I hated it. I've tried the paleo diet. I did the, the military diet, which is comically named because it has nothing to do with the military. There's all these diets out there. I've tried them all and none of them work. I am a failure. And that's heartbreaking to me. The reality is the majority of these diets are designed to essentially create temporary changes. And as we know, Temporary changes create temporary results. So people do like a whole, like a, a whole 30 or they do like a 30 day challenge. Like, man, that was great. But then they go back to doing what they were doing before, or they jump on keto and they're like, I'm out on carbs. And after five days, they've lost all that bloated water weight. And they're like, oh my God, I've lost 15 pounds. This is so good. Except they're miserable. And every day they're like white knuckling it through with their protein and their spinach. And they're just like, just, okay, I hope this gets better. Uh, unsurprisingly, it doesn't because they have eliminated like all sources of joy from their life. So they end up in these situations where they're making temporary changes without the accompanying like mental health updates or the behavioral changes or environmental changes that can assist in those areas. So they come to Nerd Fitness and we're like, fantastic. Keto, it's out. If you don't like keto, we're not going to do it. Tell me how you eat currently. Talk to me about your life at home. Talk to me about, and this is our, our coaching program. We have coaches on staff at Nerd Fitness and they literally one-on-one -on -one with clients via, via an app. Tell me how you eat. Tell me about your relationship with food growing up. This is the one time in your life you can be truly honest about what you're eating on a day-to-day -day basis, which I think is really freeing for a lot of people. And once we identify some of those things, it's like, okay, we're gonna work on the mental aspects of this. We're going to work on the behavioral aspects and we're going to start to see if we can shift, whether it's your environment, try to get a, a virtuous cycle going of, hey, like we're going to start to change your identity. We're going to change that through proving to you that some changes can stick. We're going to do it sustainably. We're going to do it enjoyably. And we're going to do it in a way in which food is no longer good or bad. You know, there's no food is not moral. It's not it's just food like it's just pizza. We're going to work on the mental hangups and the mental the relationship that people have with food. So we really prioritize a lot of that stuff from a, from like a really well-rounded perspective, just because we know that telling people to like, here, follow this meal plan of chicken and broccoli or salmon and asparagus, like is not going to work. So it's like, yeah, that might be great if everybody did it, but people aren't doing it. So why don't we try some different strategies? So we really come at it from a very different perspective. Yeah. And I love that. You said two things that I want to re-emphasize because I think they're really valuable is one is it's not about the knowledge. I have seen med medical doctors get up on stage and talk about metabolic disorders and you look at them and it's like they're, they are metabolic disorder. They're extremely obese. And it's like, they know everything there could possibly be to know about that topic and they're still failing at it. So it's not knowledge. You're not. And then I also loved how I said, it's not a moral failing either. And then I loved what you said about changing identity because it does really come down to like just a massive mindset shift in having that behavioral. So I'm kind of curious because you've been at this for a while now. You started your business in 2009. We have seen the rise of a lot of new technology start taking over. It's like I've got my aura ring on right now. It's like we have wearables. We have a million different things. Do you see a lot of new technology like helping or hindering? Is technology exposing some issues? Is it helping with some issues? I, I want to hear your thoughts on how some technologies have maybe changed the fitness landscape. Sure. I think, I mean, first and foremost, obviously my business would not exist without technology. So technology, big fan of the internet and, and computers. I think Technology, there's a great blog called Stratechery, 
And Ben Thompson specifically talks about how technology and the internet is like an accelerant and a friction reducer. And I think that's both really good and really bad. I think it's really good because it can reduce the friction between, like you said, the movies back in the 70s and 80s, the jocks ran the gym and nerds like that was they could they didn't feel at home in those places. They didn't have a place to go. So like I said, I started Nerd Fitness in 2009 because I didn't, it wasn't like, ooh, I think nerd culture is going to be popular. I was just a dork playing video games and I liked helping people not get started and I didn't think there was a home for that. So I just like, I'm just going to start writing. So technology gave me the opportunity to, instead of training people one-on-one -on -one in a gym, I can now write an article and send an email out to hundreds of thousands of people and it can impact them in their own home. They can read it on their own schedule. I think a lot of people are really self-conscious still of going to a gym. So we help them overcome some of those fears and challenges by saying like, hey, here's a workout program you can do at home. Also, here's some accountability and some non-judgmental empathy as well. So like, hey, like we understand what you're struggling with. Like almost like MacGyver, like tell me what your situation is and we're going to build a build an environment for you or with you so that those things can fit. So I think technology has empowered so many more people and allowed a lot of people that might have felt alone in the past to now feel connected. I The nerd fitness community, the we call ourselves the rebellion in paying homage to Star Wars uh, is the thing I'm most proud of. I'm just proud to be a small part of it. I'm just like one guy that happens to be in this community that is really supportive and worldwide, which is amazing. At the same time, I think it's really easy to just say like, bam, we're just going to slap AI on it and or we're just going to, oh, we're going to technology is going to run everything. And I think without accompanying like a really strong motivation, like a really strong reason or really strong behavioral environmental change as a result, it's really easy to let the technology do the work and forget that you were, why you're doing it in the first place. I'll share an example. So I signed up for a meditation app. So I was like, I'm super stressed out. I am running crazy. I hear meditation's good. These apps seem like a great way to do it. So I signed up for one of the apps and there's gamification of you do it every day and you get a little checkbox. And then after a certain number of days, you earn a medal. Like, ooh, this is great. I think I got up to like 50 days in a row. I got a little icon or a medal. It's like, this is awesome. And then I got hooked on just like, okay, I, I, I don't even think I was meditating. I was just like, oh, I have to get it for this day so I can keep my schedule going. And then for whatever reason, I was traveling. I missed one day. And then I don't think I meditated again for like four years after that. So I was like, like literally I missed one day, like the whole Jerry Seinfeld, like, oh, put an X on a calendar. Like, that's great. And it works really well until it doesn't. So I think there can be some challenges with this whole, like, don't break the streak or tracking streaks or tracking Xs that like you can get really hooked on the streak and forget why you started doing it in the first place. Almost like the tail wagging the dog. So if you're not careful, you can almost outsource everything to technology, forget the reason why you started to do it in the first place. And then if that technology inevitably fails or you miss a day or something, the underlying habit might not have been properly built and the motivation and the behavior behind it might not have been properly established. So it's really easy to fall all the way back to where you were because, well, I did 150 days in a row, but I missed one. Like, There's no way I'm going to do 152 days in a row to get back to that streak. But like the reality is you just missed a day. Like who cares? Just do it the next day. But that app is now like very specifically telling you like your streak is zero and you have to start all over again. So technology can be great. It can help spread more information from like wearables and tech. It can be a great way to draw your attention to things that you might want to focus on a little bit more. Personally, I'm of the opinion that like wearing like a glucose monitor, unless you're a diabetic is probably giving you more information than you need and could be confounding the results that you might need or getting you to focus on the wrong thing. So I think there's some tech that can be good. I think a lot of people might take this biohacking stuff a little too far. And the people that are like the people that really need the most help could probably get overwhelmed by this stuff. So it's like finding the technology that simplifies things or gets out of the way to help them build like those really basic fundamental exercise habits or nutritional yeah. changes so that you focus on that stuff. Yeah. And the motivation, the underlying motivation, I think is absolutely huge. And I'm so glad you brought up a thing with the app. Like 
this isn't even fitness related, but I used to have Duolingo. So Duolingo is famous for that. You get, it's like little duo bird. He's cheering you on. He's like, you can do it. You can do it. And you're like, I don't want to let this little bird down. So you're really good about studying your language. And I was actually studying Russian for quite a while. I can speak maybe two words, so don't even ask. <laughs> but then like Duolingo reached out to me and they were like, you're doing so good with your streak. And I ended up like, I don't even know how this happened. I ended up becoming like the state representative ambassador for the Russian language. <laughs> and it was like, it was totally detached from what was actually happening because the original goal was to learn Russian. And then the end goal came down to maintaining my streak. So I would just like, I would get on the app and I would just like hit, give me a hit. And I would just be like punching it in just so I could get my streak, not actually learning Russian, not becoming successful at the end goal. But then it's like this new goal, this more addicting goal got created where I was maintaining my app or my streak on the app. And I think that it's like what you said is the same thing. So how do you help people identify what their true motivator is? Because I think that's really like, if we were to boil this all down, that's the main problem. It's not knowledge. It's not, well, sometimes it's accessibility. Sometimes it is knowledge, but truly it comes down to motivation. And like, I look at myself right now, I've been a competitive athlete in the past. I was not as a kid, like as a kid, I was, you know, playing Starcraft. So that was my thing as a kid, not interested in fitness as a kid, became a very competitive athlete as an adult. I got really into strongman. And then the last maybe year I got married and I just really lost interest and I don't have that motivation anymore. I'm like, was I just doing this to find a husband? <laughs> it's like, now it's, I just, I couldn't care less. And I am like, I know I should. I've been doing this for a long time. All my knowledge is there. Accessibility is there. There are literally no barriers for me. And I still don't do the thing. So how do you help people identify their true motivation and make that sustainable? Sure. I, so nerd fitness, we call it your big, your big why. Essentially, it's working with people and really it's like you just keep asking why over and over until we get to the root cause of maybe most people come to us for generally weight loss. I'm trying to lose weight. I got a wedding coming up or I got, I want to run a 5k next year, or I'm about to have my first kid or whatever it may be. And I'm looking to, to get in shape. So that's fantastic. Like at the same time, Let's talk about where you're at, what your goals are. Uh, maybe how do you view yourself? And it's like, well, I'm just trying to lose weight and so then I'll feel better about myself. It's like, okay, like that's certainly possible. Like, what do you think about like when you look in the mirror, what do you see and why? It's like, well, I want to feel more confident. It's like, okay, like why do you want to feel more confident? In some instances, it's because I'm trying to date for the first time or I got a scare from the doctor and I'm really worried about my health. It's like, okay, like that's a, that's an interesting angle or so I think there's like that deep psychological level of like really getting down to the root of why. I think like you, I was somebody that almost like never missed a workout and like built my life around it. I think eventually I came to realize that like I was optimizing out a lot of the things that made like why I was doing it in the first place. Right. So I love spending time with friends. I love on Friday nights with my wife, we eat pizza and drink Prosecco and watch a movie and with the dogs in the couch. And like, that's that just what we do. So perfect. I love it. It's not, we don't, it's definitely not a cheat meal because I'm not cheating on anything because I'm an adult and I like pizza. So I chose to eat pizza on Friday and that's perfectly acceptable. So like at the same time, I still exercise now, but I exercise because I'm like, I want to be able to stay fit and active when I'm 70. Or I want to stay fit because I like how it makes me feel after a workout. Or I like to exercise because I want to find out what I'm capable of with strength. It makes every other part of my life better. So like I'm focused on how it makes me feel and not that like I, oh, I'm not going to break a streak or I don't have a particular lift goal. I think what we found with most of our clients is they come to us for weight loss and their goal is to reach a specific goal weight. But as they start to lose weight, and we help them identify types of exercise that they actually enjoy, their goals shift from weight to performance. They're like, I wonder what I'm capable of now. And it starts with, oh, I wonder if I could run a 5K or like, I've always wanted to do a handstand or I want to do a pull-up, like, awesome. Let's get you there. And as they get empowered in these areas, they then might look to other parts of their lives. Oh, I wonder, like, maybe I don't feel as stuck as I used to. Now that I'm in shape, I wonder if I could go hike Machu Picchu or oh, I wonder if taking that new job is actually something I'm willing to try. So there's like different levels of motivation. And like 
sounds like you're going through quite a bit. You got married, you're, you're getting a master's, you're working on this podcast. Like, yeah, I totally get it that you might not have the same excitement and zeal to train. Like that's also okay. Like that might be the season of life you're in right now. That doesn't make you a bad person. That doesn't mean you suddenly have this moral failing that you didn't have. It just means that like right now it might not be as much of a priority. Like that's totally okay. Well, Thank you for that. I, I needed to hear that. And it's not just me. It's like, I know that that millions of people have gone through similar things. I was just talking to another friend of mine about this recently, who was a competitive athlete. I won't say any, I won't say what sport he was in, but he was top tier because I people, it's, he's a good friend of mine. I don't want people to know who he is, but top tier athlete got married and then just started gaining weight, got chubby. And he's just like, what happened? So we've just been talking about like those motivation changes and the, and the shifting and I think it is interesting, big life changes, your motivations change. And who knows, somebody who's maybe they're really good at training for a while and then their life changes, their motivations change. And then they start thinking it's like, oh, it's a moral failing. Like you said, they're like, I must be broken or whatever, but it's not. And it's renegotiating your identity, circling back to what we were talking to earlier. It's renegotiating your identity with yourself and discovering your new motivation. So I'm curious, do you ever find with your population people who don't have a strong enough motivator to do the thing? Absolutely. All the time. Like, first of all, we're all disasters, right? Like, let's be honest here. Like, watching Wally, like, we are all disasters on a rock hurling through space. None of this makes sense, et cetera. So, like, we are also broken helping people who are broken but, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It's like, we, that's just like, that's human nature. Like we're all trying to figure this stuff out. Anybody that tells you they have like the key to life is lying to you or has something to sell you. So I think reality is more like, hey, we have people that come to us, like, I'm going to try to lose weight. And there is this thing called, I think it's the abstinence violation effect. And it's the thing that we see over and over again with, with clients. It's something we point out to them before they even start. But it's this idea that, like, oh, I'm going to join a running club or I'm going to work out with a personal trainer and they go for the first two sessions or three sessions. Things are great. But then they miss a session. Their kid got sick. The work ran late, whatever. And they miss a session and they feel so badly about missing a session that they then miss the next one because they're afraid to go back and admit that they missed the previous one. And then with each missed session, they just stay further and further away until they get to the point where like, I can't, you know, like, oh, it's been a year and I can't go back to it because who knows what they're going to think about me because I missed all these running sessions. Like when people join us, it's like, welcome. What do you, what is your biggest fear joining nerd fitness? Like my fear is that I'm going to give up after two weeks. I'm like, congratulations. You are definitely going to give up after two weeks. And here's why, because life is going to happen. Like it's not a bad thing. That's just what happens. So everything inside of you is going to tell you to go hide in a hole and to sh feel ashamed and beat yourself up and not come back. That's, that's the old you talking. That's the pattern that you've already told us you find yourself in. So instead, let's preemptively put something in place where even if you miss that workout and you, the next day, we'll, our coaches will still message you through the app with a funny meme or something. Even if you send back an emoji just to let us know that you're still reading. We've had people join our coaching program and our coaches will still message them and send them funny memes semi-regularly, even if they're not responding. And then six months later, They'll be like, I saw every one of these messages. I really appreciate you sticking with me. I'm in a different place now and I'm ready to start again. It's like, no problem. We've been it. here the whole time and we'll still be there for you the next time things go poorly. Life is not normal and that's totally normal. Like that's fine. And we're all struggling with stuff. We're all dealing with this. So we identify those things ahead of time. We tell people exactly how things are going to go and that voice in their heads to try to preempt some of it. And then we're still there to pick them up and support them when they are willing to come back if they guilt ghost dust for two weeks or three weeks or whatever it may be. It's like, no problem. Like, we're still here. We really pride ourselves on non judgmental messaging of like, we're not going to guilt you for feeling to feel bad that you missed something. It's like, all right, did you miss it because you were doing something fun? I hope. Like, that's cool. How was it? Like, great. Did you eat cake? What flavor was it? Was it really good? I hope so because I also had cake yesterday. Like, we're just normal people trying to help people through this stuff too. I truly love that because it's you, you, like, this is one reason why I've always been a fan of your, a fan of your brand. Cause it's like, 
you can sense these things from a distance usually. And it's like that, it's that wholesome leadership that people need. Like people need that, like that friendship and camaraderie. And you're talking about like um, earlier, you were saying um, about how, you know, people level up and then they're like, oh, well, I wanted to lose weight. Now I want to do this performance goals. And it's almost like you're helping them move along Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And sometimes they're getting stuck at a certain level and you just still show up non-judgmental because it's like one of our basic human needs is love and acceptance. And people cannot reach self-actualization without love and acceptance. So how could they possibly ever become the best client, athlete, friend that they can if they're feeling like you're judging them? And that's something I do unfortunately see a lot in the fitness industry still is there's these coaches that'll come out there and they'll be like, if you're not at least 95%, then you can't work with me because we're the cool kids or whatever. And it's just like, that's not helping. Like the only kind of energy that's attracting are other people who are self-deprecating and like, there's almost like there's this energy of wanting to feel needed. And they're like, well, if I hit a hundred percent and I'm on it with this coach loves me, then I'll be accepted. But it's never going to work. It's never going to satisfy that need because it's never wholesome to begin with. So I love that you're able to take people from the bottom and help them move up towards self-actualization through recognizing wherever they are at in their journey. And I will give a shout out to Mark right now. He's a friend of mine who, because it's like, again, it's like, I'm admitting I'm in this with you guys. I've been a competitive athlete for years. I was a national level strongman competitor. And I just I have not had it in me for a year. And I think every day for the past two months, he's texted me every morning and just said, do fit. And every single day I have not done it <laughs> and he keeps sexy me. He's like, do fitness today. And it's just like, I love it. He's just like, he's still there. Some days I'll just like his comment. Some days I'll ignore it. <laughs> it's like, but he knows. And I asked him for the accountability and he is still there. And I appreciate people like that. I mean, it's good to have people in your corner that are, will both support you and also be understanding just to riff a little bit on what you were saying that. I think there's plenty of people that are former Navy SEALs or former badass athletes that are like super hardcore and want people to like rocks and then like jump in a cold plunge <laughs> and then jump in a cold plunge and then like punch a brick wall and wrestle a bear. And I'm like, that sounds terrible. Like I want nothing to do with any of that. I can't relate to it. Uh, I would much rather sit on my couch and play video games, but like brushing my teeth or, uh, wearing pants in public, like I prefer to, you know, occasionally exercising is the thing I should do because it makes me feel good. And it's the right thing to do for me at this point. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do my 30 minutes of working out. I don't particularly have any goals right now. I think I even sent an email out to the nerd fitness email list, but I was just like, I've been half-assing my workouts for six months. I'm working on a big project on the side and I have other life and travel things and whatever. I've been half-assing my workout. I don't mind. I don't care. I'm like half-assing a workout is so much better than not doing anything. So I'm like, I'm just going to do what I can today with the mental bandwidth I do have available and that's it. And then I'm going to get back to living the rest of my life because I don't want my life to revolve around this completely. It's part of what I do, but it's not at the expense of, you know, who I am. Yeah. Well, and you've built up, I think you've probably built up enough because it's like motivation only goes so far. Discipline is what sustains and you've built up enough discipline around your habits that you're able to just stick with it just like brushing your teeth and putting on clothes to go out in public it's just it's a part of your lifestyle and that's the part that I think is once people can get over that hurdle they are more in that like active for life category if you're looking at it from a long-term athletic development standpoint it really does help to have a lot of accountability in the beginning once it becomes like a habit and it's consistent People can be a little bit more like with where you're at, where it's like they can fall off just a little bit, but it's never truly falling off. It's just scaling up or scaling down. So that's cool. I love that. I love that you shared that example. Yeah, it's like it's kind of like investing in a 401k, right? Like when was the best time to invest is like probably when you were 23. But if you didn't start then, the next best day would be now. Like, yes, it would have been awesome if you were lucky enough to be born with to loving parents that also loved fitness, that de made it normal and prioritized healthy eating. Like the majority of us didn't come from that environment. So we're picking up the pieces in our 30s or in our 40s and we're like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I've never been in a gym before. The majority of my food is cooked in a microwave or from a fast food window. Like, where do I even get started? It's like, no problem. Like, yes, it would have been great if we had started a while back, but we're going to start here. We're going to put some of those habits in place. And also as a result of that, like 
down the road, this does get a little tiny bit easier, or you can take your foot off the gas pedal a little bit because of all of the changes that you're starting to make and the discipline that's starting to kick in. Absolutely. No, and I, I really love and appreciate that. For those of you watching on YouTube, my my dog, I think you heard the Amazon truck. So <laughs> it's one of his greatest anxieties in life. One of these days, I, I if I go missing, it might be the Amazon driver. My dog's convinced of it. So I'm just soothing some of his anxiety. But back to the topic, do you do you see things getting better or worse or staying the same for the specific population of like nerds and geeks? Because the people listening to the show are, they're sci-fi fans. Like we're nerds, we're geeks. Like, and I love, it. I love being who I am. I wouldn't see any other way. Do you see this population improving their fitness, staying the same or getting worse? I mean, I think improving just because I think there's fitness has been made more egalitarian, right? There's so many more ways for people to get interested in fit. Back in the day, it was you had to go to Gold's Gym and you're pumping iron or you put on your neon spandex and go to aerobics. And you're like, if you don't like either of those things, like you're kind of out of luck. Now it's like, you can do live action role-playing. You can go to sweet, like killer dance classes. You can go to like a, a swing class. You can go rock climbing. You can go hiking. There's like an infinite number of ways for people to get excited about exercise and find their tribe of people that are like them. Uh, can I just interrupt I think, you yeah. and say okay. that I really appreciated you including LARPing in exercise because that's the thing that a lot of people don't realize. It's exhausting. They, well, I've never actually, like, I've never done it, but it actually looks fun. I'm like, I would go pretend to, like, slay dragons. That'd be so cool. I've just, it's, it's I haven't stepped into that yet. Might be LARPing as an astronaut with NASA soon. Who knows? Well, that'll be, that's a whole separate topic. But I appreciate you saying that because exercise doesn't have to be 1970s Gold's Gym. It can be activities that you actually enjoy. Yeah, your heart is doesn't have eyes. It doesn't know what you're doing. And it's like, oh, this exercise, oh, you're only running. And that's not going to do it. Who cares? Your muscles respond to stimuli. Your heart responds to needing to beat faster. Like literally anything that gets you off the couch. Uh, it could be Beat Saber in for, in VR, in a VR headset. Like you could do, you, I've seen people like sweating bullets after doing VR workouts. That's awesome. Like if that's what works for you, that's amazing. I think the challenge or the thing that I, I want people to understand is like exercise is actually like a pretty terrible tool for weight loss. Exercise is great for heart health, lung health, mental health, building muscle, changing your physiology. It's your nutrition and calories consumed that is going to adjust the number that you see on the scale. So I think there's a lot of frustration with people who pick a workout routine that they don't like with the goal of losing weight. And they go to the boot camp class or some guy yelling motivational platitudes at them, which again, you couldn't pay me to go to one of those classes. They're like, this is miserable. And then they step on the scale and they're like, well, I'm broken. My metabolism must be broken. It's like, no, 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 like we're just playing on the wrong scorecard here. Like we need to get, we need to focus on the right thing. So for you, it's what actually gets you up and moving. And then it's like, we should probably maybe go to some therapy and start working on our relationship with food and identifying where we can maybe start to cut back on some liquid calories or some other things. So I'm bringing, bring this all back around to like, where are we going? I think nerds are going to be, <laughs> I think nerds are going to be fine. I am an eternal optimist. I'm also a techno optimist. I think like society as a whole, yes, the trends have continued to get worse. I'm a wary of trends. I'm also really wary of making elaborate predictions. I was in doing research for this podcast. I, I found this thing. It was like in the 1890s. It's like the Times of London said that all like they expected that the city was going to be buried under nine feet of horse manure because of how many people would be on horses. And by, by like the fall middle of, by 1950, and then they invented a car and they're like, oh, wait a second. Never mind. Horses are out the window. Uh, Wilbur Wright said something like I'm man will never fly in 500 years or a thousand years. And then three years later, he flew an airplane. So we have a tendency to take where we're going now and just extrapolate it. But there are these things called black swan events. They're often negative, but they can also be positive. There are people cleaning up the great big garbage patch. They have found worms that eat plastic so like holy crap that's amazing and also we have tons of clients at nerd fitness that are also on glp1 weight loss drugs like semaglutide or what's the i think it's called like terazepam so many there's yeah yeah so yeah and you know, big intramine correct reforming. so like <laughs> those things are simply a tool 
in a toolbox that lots of people can use. Now, the, so far, the studies are showing that people that are on it are losing at least 5% of their weight, maybe up to 20. So again, I'm not a doctor. If anybody wants to follow a doctor who does talk about this stuff, his name's Dr. Spencer Nadolsky. He's a doctor of family medicine and obesity, and he also posts killer memes on Instagram. He's the man <laughs> and just a great dude. There are We have clients at Nerd Fitness that have had weight loss surgery. They are on these, essentially it's like appetite suppressant medications initially for diabetes, but it's resulting in them not thinking about food all day long. And the results are in, they're losing 15, sometimes 20% of their body weight when they stay on this medicine. I'm not going to say that you should be on it or you shouldn't be on it. That's not for me to say. Uh, I will say that it seems like for the people that are on it, it has been or could be life-changing. So I think this potentially could be an inflection point. There's also just all these technological advances. I think science tends to hopefully fix future problems. So I'm, like I said, I'm a techno optimist and I hope that things can turn a corner and we can move in this direction of getting things better. So I think nerds are going to be okay. The population as a whole, we both know it's not education. We know it's not shaming people. It's going to be, it's going to come from environmental or societal larger adjustments, which we could dive into more too. Yeah, no, it's, I love you saying that because we always end up going into a for, for whatever reason, on almost every episode, we mention Uncle Ben. <laughs> With great power comes great responsibility. We need to do reality check Uncle Ben shirts because I say that almost <laughs> every episode now. And it's like when there's when these new technologies come out, it's up to us to determine how it's going to be used. Literally every technology. On this podcast, we talk a lot about all sorts of things. It's like AI, the, the iRobot episode. We are talking about the awesome things that AI can give us and that also some of the potential negative effects and it's going to come down to the people. AI is not the problem. It's going to come down to the people, drug developers. It's going to come down to them making sure that there's policies, medical professionals are educated, and then making sure that these things are getting distributed in a way that's actually going to help people. So the technologies I think can always be helpful, but with the great power comes great responsibility. And it's so exciting to see, like you you mentioned, what was that? What was that? point called the with the black swan effect um, oh yeah black by black swans were like by definition you can't see them coming right it's like the 2008 financial crash or the war in russia are like negative black swans but also like just this is a, a random example but nvidia had made all of these graphics cards to essentially flood the market for cryptocurrency miners so they make all of these and then all of a sudden the price of crypto plummets they're like they're they like literally write off the value of these graphics cards. They're like, oh, we're not, we don't, nobody's buying them. They're too expensive. They're not optimized for the right thing. And then somebody figured out like, wait a second, we can use these graphic cards for artificial intelligence. Like, oh, that's interesting. Okay. And since then, I think NVIDIA is up like, I don't can't say hundreds of percents so far this Maybe. year because of the thing that they wrote off. Like they didn't necessarily see that coming. Somebody did. And so like there might be people that have, but like you can't predict what these things might be. These weight loss drugs were designed for diabetes. And as a side effect, it had an, a, a weight loss suppressant effect. What's funny is actually there was, I think it was, I want to say JP Morgan or one of the, one of the big banks put out a report that said like, these are all of the industries that will be negatively impacted by all of these weight loss drugs. And it was like Frito-Lay and Coca-Cola and like these companies might be negatively impacted because people are going to consume fewer calories from those sources. And like in the short term, it might affect quote unquote capitalism. At the same time, it might save people's lives and allow them to live 10 years longer or to live healthier, happier, and they can travel more and they can, they'll have to buy new clothes. So like, because they're now going to fit into different size things. So like, it's so interesting. There's so many like knock on or second order or third, fourth, fifth order effects that we can't predict. And again, not an expert, just a a, a fan of waxing philosoph philosophical about this stuff. But we can't predict what's going to happen. I'm just of the mindset that we figured out quite a bit before as humans, and I hope that we can continue to do so. And this is an area specifically helping humans develop a healthier relationship with food moving forward. I hope that's something that this technology and government policy and stuff can like actually impact change. Well, not to toot your horn for you, but people like you making a difference too, making it accessible, like truly, like making it a space where everybody can feel like they belong. 
I was the kid who I truly, this is a true story. I would ask the teacher if I could stay inside from recess and organize books instead of going, <laughs> I was really me instead of going outside because the other kids were more physically fit than me. Like I was almost my full height by the time I was in sixth grade, but I had like zero muscle tone. So I was a gangly child and I was so scared of going out to just play in recess as an elementary school kid that I just opted out completely. Big shout out to my middle school physical fitness teachers, Miss Posey and Miss Pays, who changed it for me and made it accessible. So yeah, it comes down to the drug developers, the policymakers, but it's also the people on a smaller scale, like like your business and like middle school and high school teachers, parents, friends who can impact monumental amounts of change to people. Because if we can create a society where we are supporting each other's activity levels and helping people of every size, every, and it's like, it, it's not just people who are overweight. It can also be people who are underweight. Like I was, who felt awkward in a gym because I was like, I look silly. I felt like goofy. I felt like a gangly creature. So it's like, it's creating those places where everyone can feel like this is for them. And I love, that. like, I love that the culture is changing. And I appreciate how you're talking about the, it's not all bad. It's not just our trajectory straight into the people of Wally. It Sure. We don't know where it could go. We don't. I, I think, like I said, I have hope and rebellions are built on hope as we learned from Rogue One Nerd. that I am. <laughs> <laughs> I just sneak that in there. I just, I don't know. I've just been, I've been wrong so many times that like I'm just, trying to be right and instead just like expecting to be surprised or in awe or to have my mind exploded at what comes out of something and just like preparing for that. I re reference Black Swans. That's a concept from Nassim Taleb. He also has a great book called Anti-Fragile. And it's this idea that we as humans or this concept instead of like the opposite of fragile isn't robust. It's like the things that gain from disorder. So I'll try to simplify this to really easily. But like, if you want to exercise, when you break down your muscle, then rebuilds itself stronger. And that's like a slightly oversimplification of it. But it's like introducing disorder to your life. Vaccines, another example of like introducing a small version of the virus so that your body overcompensates and gets stronger as a result. And then is vaccinated from that experience or whatever it may be. So I love this idea of like, hey, we can't predict what the next black swan will be. All we can do is like try to develop ourselves as anti-fragile. I know you talked about this on your episode in the Dune podcast, but like diversity, genetic diversity, exercise, eating a diverse nutritional palate, eating or working out in diverse ways so that your muscles are challenged in different ways. Like prepare yourself for the chaos because life is chaos. So like if we can just do that, then... When the chaos shows up, we're not surprised. We're like, hey, come on in. Front door's open. Have a seat on the couch, chaos. And uh, let's. we're just going to figure out where to go from here. So optimistic, not that things are going to always get better, but optimistic that humans as a species, due to our diverse, the way our brains work and our bodies work and different countries and communities and companies doing all different things, like what we're going to be able to accomplish and how we're going to be able to solve some of these problems, I think will surprise us and it will come from somewhere that we're least expecting it. Absolutely. That just, oh, I don't know. I, I actually literally have goosebumps right now because that's one of the things that I've loved the most about this podcast is discovering just the deep layers of optimism with all the different professionals and experts that I've been talking to. And they're like, yeah, there's some really cool things happening for humanity in the future. And if you look at because it's like people like to make the anecdotal reference. It's like, oh, back in the day, people didn't have as much depression or people didn't have weight problems. It's like, yeah, but they had a lifespan of living to 60. And way back in the day, well, it's they like, had plenty of other problems, too. Right, right. And it's like I see humanity trending better in every way possible. And just because our generation is faced with certain limbs, um, specifically with mental health, physical health and other various things, it's like. As a global population, we are trending upwards. Like hunger worldwide is down. That's amazing. Disease worldwide is down. That's amazing. Like even poor people in America can have basic access to things like cell phones, internet. It, it's like at, as a whole, humanity is always getting better. And that just makes me so happy. 
So before I ask you our reality check question, I kind of want to just give you some space to talk about anything else that you had maybe thought of during our discussion or you had wanted to say. Honestly, I just really enjoyed, I really enjoyed having this conversation and I hope people take it from the perspective of it's really easy to see things on the internet or to interact with people on the internet and just assume the worst. So I appreciate that we're able to have the conversation from the place of like, we're both trying to help people and entertain and to take from this what is most helpful to them. So I think it's really easy to look at Wally, especially if you've been inundated with or in like toxic diet culture on the internet and then see Wally and say like, this is this is garbage. Uh, Pixar is shaming fat people. And I think I um, hope that this can encourage people to look at it one level deeper and say, like, that's not necessarily what Pixar is doing here. Pixar instead is pointing out just how important our environments are to who we are as people. Like I said, it's not a moral failing. Of course, technology has accelerated or reduced the friction for us from some bad habits. It's also made other things unbelievably great. So I think Wally just perfectly shows. You know, we are products of our environment. We are creatures of habit. There are so many environmental factors that willpower alone is not going to be able to fix. If people are like, just put down the fork, like that's yeah. so unhelpful and it doesn't work. Again, so you talked to you talked about doctors who are doctors of metabolic disease who are suffering from that very condition yeah. because not because they are a moral failure, but because there is some aspect of modern life and biology that is, I mean, 70% of America, I think, is overweight at this point. I imagine it's similar in some other Western countries. Yeah. So it is it is a it's a disease that people are working on. And it seems like we're starting to find some things that could maybe help bring it yeah. all together or well, help, help turn that corner, rather. And it's kind of cute to think about it in a motivation and environmental sense. Because my favorite scene in the whole movie is when the captain like goes to stand up for the first time he gets out of his chair it's like 2001 space odyssey music comes on yeah and it's like it's so cute because it's like and i think one thing that it's highlighting because it's like they, there's that point where it's like they're showing all the different captains posters on the wall it's like they yep. start off like looking like like modern day people and they keep getting bigger and bigger until we reach our modern day captain and it's like it i think what these people were experiencing was a complete loss of motivation and an environment can totally conducive to that lifestyle that that was not helpful to them and as soon as these humans realized they're like we can go back to earth we could rebuild like it was like that motivation it turned on it flipped their life around and i think for some people who are struggling like maybe a major life change is in order maybe you need to move maybe you need to maybe you need a new job like maybe you need that major change that will inspire you to become that best version of yourself again yeah, and not, and I, I think just kindness goes such a long way. It's really we're we're we are our worst critics, and it's really easy to beat ourselves up and say, "I can't believe I ate that entire pint of ice cream." Like you're not alone. That doesn't make you a bad person. These are things that we can work on. I will again say it. I'm a huge fan of therapy and encouraging people to go to therapy. I hope that if you have health insurance, if you're fortunate enough to have health insurance, reaching out to them and finding out if you can get go to therapy through. Through your, through your health insurance. I think something I would, we talked about all this stuff and what I hope changes could exist. I hope that the medical industry can continue to move towards prevention rather than treatment. So yes. allowing people to spend their insurance money on whether it's gym memberships or working with a registered dietitian, like really going out of their way as companies to do that because it studies are in like when people are healthier and happier, like they miss fewer days of work. They are more positive members and contribute to society more. Like all of these things are like a net positive for society. And they're more um, creative it's just that, too. Sure. And we just have this, the, the scorecard for it, for that industry is backwards where it's let people get sick or to a place where they can't take care of themselves and then bleed them dry with taking the money to support or, deal with the symptoms at that point i hope that we can continue to move in this other direction of hey like this is actually going to be really good it's easy to say like to be pie in the sky and overly moral and say like oh everybody should just it's i want to combine that with reality of like no this is actually really good policymakers and companies and things like having healthier happier people is like really that's also really good business it's not just 
uh, treating the sick or treating the uh, people after they've had to like, develop heart disease or whatever it may be. No, I love it. I love it. Oh, this has actually been such a positive conversation and that makes my day because this is something that could easily have been like doom and gloom. And I just like, I love your energy and the the positive light that you brought to this. So I think our answer is kind of obvious. If you guys want to leave what you think our score is going to be in the comments before Steve answers, we'll see if you're right. So I actually just had to look this up because I'm changing our question slightly. So Steve. Okay. So Wally took, so it came out in 2008, but it took place in 2805. So do you think by 2805, we will all be living on the Axiom Space Hotel, <laughs> which actually the Space Hotel is going to happen. And we will all be like the people of Wally. Where would you give that a score on our reality check scale, one to five? Yeah, I, I think. I mean, this is going to be like, oh, what a middle of the roader. But I was going to say like something like a between like a two and a three, where like I just don't see us. I'll say maybe like a three. I'll not say no that like, hey, it's very possible that like something happens and humans have to get on spaceships and go populate, like go live on spaceships, like in the expanse or whatever it may be. And I realize there are companies working on this stuff. So it's not impossible, but I don't think like it's either that or it's like things are just going to be like this and be like, oh, that was normal. Like we'll just be on iPhone. We'll be on our iPhone 827s. Probably still posting memes on Instagram being like, oh, this is, this is silly. Um, yeah. it's, uh, so I'm going to say like three, like okay. parts of the movie. I was like, I could see it. But I also think that technology and society and there will be people that will impact things positively so that things don't get to a point of no return. I love it. Oh, that makes me so happy. And it does. It We see positive changes all the time. The silkworms. We're fixing the ozone. We're rebuilding the ice caps. They have machines that are rebuilding the ice caps. It's like humans are amazing. So if you are somebody who's working in STEM and you are part of these changes, good on you. You have my biggest high five. So Steve, are there any fun projects that you're working on that you want to share with us? Where can people find you? And if they're interested in signing up to work with you, where can they hear more about you? Totally. So I am a writer by... Well, I'd say by trade, but I, I love writing and I send out a weekly newsletter at Nerd Fitness. You just sign up for the newsletter at the every Monday. It's a weird thought from my brain directly into yours or into your inbox. Love, love to do that. And then the team at Nerd Fitness sends out emails on Wednesdays and Wednesdays and Fridays. So love that. I, I just love writing. That's how I built Nerd Fitness is I put my head down and wrote like a thousand articles over wow. five years or eight years. It's like just every day, just writing. So uh, I am working on a super secret project that uh, may or may not be book shaped that I can't talk about quite yet. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I just, and then I also, um, I write a really fun, uh, just nerdy newsletter at stevecam.com too, which is just like, I nerd out about random stuff that has nothing to do with health and fitness generally. So you generally you'll find me on the internet you can look me up on Instagram, nerd fitness. If you're looking for a coach, we have a team of amazing coaches that are nerdier uh, than I could ever be. And also like I'm really good at this stuff. So if you're looking for help from the comfort of your home and want to have a nerd fitness coach in your pocket, check it out. It's all available at nerdfitness.com. Oh, I love it so much, Steve. Thank you so much. So let me know in the comments if you guys agree or disagree with his score. And if you would have added anything to this conversation, please let us know. We are very interested to hear your thoughts. Until next time, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to Reality Check.